Welcome to a fantastic episode of Rebellion's Educational Series. I'm here with Admiral Scott Sanders, brilliant naval mind, and we're very lucky to have him here today to talk about pirates and whiskey. Admiral, thank you for It's good on. to be here with you, Alex. Appreciate it. Pleasure. I don't, no historian or other admiral would say I'm a brilliant mind, especially my wife, but I'm glad to be here talking with you. Oh, no, we love humility as well. So let's get into piracy. Who is your favorite pirate of all time? Well, some people don't consider him a pirate, but obviously the, the Spanish do, uh, Drake. Mm. So uh, Francis Drake. So he was, they were called privateers back then. So he was authorized by Queen Elizabeth to go take booty from the Spanish, the French, whoever he came across, as long as he split the take with the queen and, and, and the... So the root of piracy really comes from Queen Elizabeth. Well, no, the piracy has been around for, you know, for thousands of years. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, just, just, you know, theft at sea is piracy technically. Yeah, so so been around you since probably have now. heard of Pompey the Great back in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So yeah, of course. Pompey mm -hmm. the Great got the name Pompey the Great from defeating the pirates in the Mediterranean. Oh, Okay. And then after Pompey died, that's when Caesar got power? Or... <laughs> yeah, the whole yeah. Uh, cross in the Rubicon thing. Yes, yes. And then we got to Anthony and Actium and uh, good times in uh, Roman history. Um, yeah, the end yeah. of the, the Republic and long live Caesar. Yes, yes. And I need to check out the Battle of Actium War. Very interesting uh, battle. But, uh, you know, reverting to now whiskey, you know, as an admiral overseeing the uh, you know, American piracy effort. Was there a point in time when you were in command that you thought to yourself, you know what, after I'm done with this, I want to have a, a distillery? It didn't really come out then, but uh, I think I showed you a picture. I was... Uh, and by the way, what was your flagship, Admiral? I had two. They were, they were cruisers. So I had the USS Anzio, named after the Battle of Anzio in World War II, mm -hmm. and the Anzio, USS Inchon, named after the Battle and the Korean War, the Inchon. So, yeah. And you mentioned your favorite aircraft carrier is the Kennedy, which is... Oh, yeah. yeah John F. Kennedy, she's my favorite carrier. She's do, awesome. Do you think the Navy will find a place to house her as a museum ship, or do you think she will get scrapped? It's not looking good for her. And it's not her. looking good for her, but oh. boy, she was the pride of the Atlantic Fleet. And here's the the dirty little secret why that people who served on her like so much. She was designed as a nuclear carrier. She mm. ended up being conventional, but you need a lot of water for a nuclear carrier. So we always had fresh water on that ship because there was plenty of water, which is not always the case on other ships. Oh, really? Yeah. So uh, would you say that you had a favorite moment from serving on the Kennedy, favorite memory? Not favorite, just the, you know, when you go on cruise, it's uh well, I served in the Mediterranean. We, we, we did overseas stuff and uh, did some important missions in the early 80s and uh, just learning how to fly. I mean, I was very young. I was 24. Was Kennedy involved with Lebanon? Yep. We did the, uh, there was the, uh, we did the retaliatory strike after the, uh, the bombing in, in, uh, in uh, Lebanon there at the Marine Barracks. Yes, of course. It was a very sad day in American history. Yeah, no, no. I love the Kennedy. I really hope she becomes a museum ship, uh, but uh, no, the odds are unfortunately against her. So when you were commanding the anti-piracy fleet off of Somalia, um, how tough was the logistics there? I mean, how many ships were you dealing with? How many other countries were you in contact with? I mean, how many threats do you deal with a day? I'm sorry for so many questions at once there. So I was, I was the commander of the International Task Force, so had about 28 nations. They weren't all there at one time. Mm -hmm. And what we did was uh, we just asked, just give us whatever you can, whether it's a liaison officer with a cell phone or a ship or, what, or a ship for two days or a ship for a week. So uh, we'd had, it was so it was always maneuvering. So you're always adjusting depending on who was there. Uh, but it was great, 28 nations. Uh, but then the other piece was coordinating with other nations who didn't weren't in the international force. So I, I dealt with the Chinese because they had a counter piracy task force. I dealt with the Russians, they same thing, but they were standalone. So they weren't part of any coalition. And, uh, and then there was a thing called the, 
well, NATO may I interrupt group? you, Admiral? Uh, something that's always made me curious is the Russian battle cruisers seem to be so heavily armored uh, with so many extra missiles and whatnot. Uh, more so than the Americans. Do you have you noticed that too? Is that anything you could comment on? Oh yeah, they are. They are. They're thick. They are immensely thick ships. Yeah. So I, I it was cool. The ship I was on over there. It's called. And we don't want to get out. It's called the Black Krivak. It was a really cool ship. I mean, when I was in the Navy as a young guy, I knew a lot of <laughs> things about that ship. Oh. So it's yeah. So uh, we know Russian subs were you know at times actually much nicer than American subs. You know, they, uh, you know, the Karsk, for instance, that went down had a, a pool for their uh, crew members. Were the Russian battle cruisers nice or more on the sparse side? Yeah, uh, no, they're pretty sparse. It was, right. uh, in fact, I mean, it wouldn't occur, it was a Utiloy was the name of the ship. So it's kind of a destroyer, mm. uh, you know, but it's, I mean, it's, there's a lot of weapon systems on there. Yeah, yeah. And so, how do you feel about the new, uh, you know, the new American destroyer? By the way, that's gotten a lot of very bad press, and it's too expensive. What eight hundred thousand dollars to operate a single shell? Uh, what are we going to do about that new destroyer? Any idea there? Are you are you talking about the Zumwalt, the DD? Yeah, the Zumwalt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what people don't realize is it's kind of a transformational platform. They're only, they're only making three. Gotcha. And so they're putting a lot of systems on there that will evolve to other platforms. So a lot of the technologies there will go on to other submarines. That they'll go into a lot of other pieces. So you view the Zumwalt as kind of a scientific test ships for the Navy uh, to then kind of pivot. Uh... Yeah, I'm not as spokesman for the Navy, but, you know, yeah, just no, seeing... You know, there, there's been other, if there's been submarines in the past that they've only built one or two of, and that technology from the submarines translates to aircraft and surface ships and all over. So, yeah, it's kind of a transitional piece. Did you have a favorite submarine? Uh, I like, there's a, the USS Michigan. Hmm. Uh, it's a, uh, it's an Ohio class ballistic missile submarine that was converted to be a uh, guided, it, it has, it's basically has a lot of Tomahawk missiles on it now. Hmm. Oh, oh, wonderful. I so, think it just, I think it's a great innovation. This nation, you know, we came up with this concept and it's a very powerful ship. You know, it doesn't have intercontinental ballistic missiles, but boy, it's, it, uh, it's a nice deterrent. We're running back to Russia's gigantic battle cruisers. Do you ever see the U.S. building large battle cruisers again and battleships? You know, obviously more modern versions that could house, you know, both drones and, you know, sophisticated missiles uh, and whatnot. But do you ever see, you know, uh, things as gigantic as the New Jersey and Missouri being built again or never because of cost efficiency? I'm not so, I'm not so sure. You know, it's, no. uh, I'm not a futurist. Uh, you know, there's, but just think of all the things that are changing. I mean, you know, the cyber domain, other things, there's a lot of times you don't need as much uh, offensive power is you need presence. Yes, so, presence. I mean, I had a important. U.S. Navy cruiser for a flagship, but I didn't need that big of a ship. I could have gotten away with a much smaller ship because it's mainly about presence and doing other things. Yeah. And you know, presence is very important and, you know, uh, showing the enemy that you're there. So based on that, one would think that we would go back to castles on the sea again. So, you know, like... Uh, you know, like, like the HMS Hoche, for instance, the, the French uh, you know, battleship that was just looked basically like a floating hotel. But, you know, uh, we could have those types of things when we need to make a presence, in, you know, in a, a war zone. So from going from 28, 29 countries to running a distillery, how much easier is logistics now for uh, creating your um, whiskey? Well, it was much easier before COVID. I mean, the, the entire worldwide supply chain is dysfunctional right now, still coming out of things. So we're, we're what we call a single farm bourbon distillery. So yeah. we grow all the corn for our bourbon on site and we get the rye for it. We're, what our thing, we're high in rye for those people who know bourbon. Um, we get it from- the I'm totally bourbon. ignorant on bourbon. How do you make bourbon from scratch? Uh, that would be lovely if you could tell our viewers sure. and myself. It's uh, the, the, the protocol, the rule set, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon, as the old ditty goes. Okay. So bourbon is specified rules. So it has to be made in the United States. It has to be a minimum of 51% corn mm. in what's called the mash bill or your recipe. It has to be all cereal grain. So corn, rye, wheat, barley, whatever you want to do. 
and then and we just happen to use 25 percent rye because that's a throwback to when basil hayden was living in maryland uh you know 250 years ago and so um we do that you make it you just kind of make a porridge a mash you know and you cook it and that starts breaking down all those starches into complex sugars into simple sugars you do that you pitch the yeast and then yeast does its magic and turns all those sugars into alcohol once you so that that ferment you know that's five days or so uh once you do that then you distill it and that why you do the first time so you, you start off with basically corn beer about eight percent alcohol distill it once you 30 percent alcohol or so then you distill it again and it comes out ours comes out about 140 proof the rule on bourbon is you can't distill it higher than 160 because you want to leave the grain flavors in you're not trying to make vodka mm -hmm. and then you have to the key one of the keys is you have to put it in a new charred oak barrel that's why bourbon's so expensive because you can only use the barrel once. Oh, yeah, no, it's a, and then you put it in there no higher than 125 proof. And then you barrel it uh, or you bottle it no, uh, no lower than 80 proof. Wonderful. And I saw a great picture of General Petraeus holding one of your bottles. Uh, I know he's a big fan of yours and your distillery. Uh, yeah. Did you, you served with him or uh, when was that? Yeah, so I ran the... Uh, International Counter Piracy Office of Somalia in 2009, left early 2010. And General Petraeus was uh, the commander of Central Command then. So mm -hmm. he was my boss's boss, if you will. Yeah. And I've run into him a couple of times since then. He, he's a great American. I, he is I a great American. Really, really yeah. Like yeah, no, I'm a big fan of yours. Uh, yeah, I know he and I were talking about you since his best. So reverting back to piracy, do you have a favorite Caribbean pirate? Not really, you know, the, the Caribbean pirates are really bad people. <laughs> I mean, oh, really? They did some nasty stuff. I mean, they were they were not good people. They're not to be, a, they are not to be like. Even By the way, Drake was the one who burned the Spanish Armada in 1587, was that? Yeah, 1580, yeah. yeah 88 they, or? Yeah, that, or, yeah, so what they did, they defeated the Spanish Armada. The, the, the Spanish had a lot to do with defeating themselves. They kind of gooned it up, but they, they were more much more powerful than the English. The English outmaneuvered them because what Drake had done years prior was design a quicker, better, faster ship. So they outmaneuvered the Spanish. They kept going up to. What about the to, story of Drake sneaking over in a port, burning many of their ships? Is that true, or he snuck over and what? It didn't I thought Drake snuck over and, and burned many of the Spanish ships when they were still at harbor? Oh yeah, that was down at Cadiz. Yes, yeah, so okay. that was earlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he, can't, he would, yeah, that was an offensive action. So were the Spanish ships just slower and, and, and harder to maneuver? And so, you know, the British quicker and. Yeah, they're a galleon, you know, so yeah. back then it was a huge, big, you know, t rolling tub, you know, it was, there was nothing sleek about it where the, and Drake kind of innovated and he, he and his cousin, they, they made sort of a, a faster galleon. It wasn't that much better, but it was, it was a market improvement. I'll put it that way. Faster ships always win from Actium with the Romans versus the Egyptians to Russo Japanese with the, you know, the Japanese just absolutely obliterating the Russians. So, um, uh, you no, know, very wonderful stuff. So, can people come and visit your distillery? Do you guys have tours? Can you buy yeah, bottles we're, um, we're down here. We're about an hour south of Washington, D.C. So, mm -hmm. we're down in which, Southern Maryland. I used to fly flight test out here at the Navy base. It's called NAS Pax River. So, we're about 12 miles north of that. It's kind of beautiful farmland are you close to chesapeake country. bay at all or what's that how close are you to chesapeake bay about four miles <laughs> yeah we're four right miles there. okay great i was in chesapeake bay in september lovely area yeah so that's that kind of get what gives our bourbon a different uh you know when you're doing craft uh it just it's the the provenance of where you are so we're high in humidity so we don't you know no i know people you know maryland is very feels like the south very much the, the the maryland coast of chesapeake bay to me feels like the the deep south and it's a lovely time to visit in the spring with all the flowers really one of those beautiful places yeah, and, in the and if you're here in august it probably feels like the congo because it's so humid yeah i mean it is it's hot and sweaty here yeah no it really is but uh and, no. and so what we do we you know we're we're very traditional in the way we do it we grow everything we have this beautiful 
ancient aquifer we get our water from. Uh, but then we do some, I think I was telling you before, we're going to be flying bourbon on a Harrier jet this summer. So we're oh, getting four cool. barrels. We're, I have a buddy who owns a Harrier. I own a distillery. So we're coming together to do a, uh, a thing for charity for this thing called Semper Fi in America's Fund. We're going to fly bourbon. And also the USS Constellation in Baltimore Harbor. You guys yep. distilled yeah, uh, rum there. on the ship in Baltimore. So it's always moving. That's Unfortunately, it. whoever the insurance company for the city of Baltimore said it's too dangerous to have four barrels of uh, rum on there, even though I gave them 300 years of actuarial tables from the Royal Navy showing that rum on a ship won't explode, but they uh, didn't buy it. Uh, no, rum has a long history on our I ships. said there might be a fist fight, but there's, there's not going to be an explosion or a fire, that's for sure. Oh, no. Uh, definitely. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation, uh, Admiral. I know you mentioned to me before the show that the Battle of Midway was your uh, favorite naval battle. Would you say the Japanese lost because of poor logistics or would you interpret it differently? No, it, there's, boy, there's a lot of people. Or I guess poor communication, not logistics, right? Well, they were too timid. You know, it was because they had a greater it, force on the field. They, oh, huge. They had, they had four aircraft carriers oh. and we had three and one was limping. <laughs> so the, uh, I mean, we were heavily outnumbered. Uh, like most Japanese battle plans, it was overly complex. Uh, the Admiral was a little bit, he, he yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. He, he could make a decision. And so there was a, there's a 20 minute period of, of time in there. And I don't know when it was. It, early in the morning the, the Japanese were winning the early part and then in this 20 minute period that turned the tide we sank two we tanked two aircraft carriers I mean in, in 20 minutes and the other one was a blaze I mean they were it was over after that they still wanted to keep going by the way they they were after they lost it they still had a battleship out there they could have they could have really kept going but they decided when the battle was over going. they still had a greater force in the field uh, right? they were yeah the, don't worry they they were a formidable uh enemy then. How would you have used Yamato if you were the Japanese Admiral in World War II? They had this just amazing battleship that just sat on the sidelines for years. You said, how would I what? Yamato, the, the, the world's largest battleship. They, they never used her barely throughout uh, the war. Uh, I mean, do you think, would you have used her more aggressively or? Was she kind of, um, they, they were all, the Japanese, and again, there's better military historians than me, they were always looking for this penultimate battle. They love that. So that's what, it's kind of like with the Russia Japanese war. They love that. They, like the, were, they uh, wanted the final, that with the, the final American. countdown battle. Yeah. yeah. And we were always doing the rope a dope. We were, you know, we yeah. were maneuvering around. Very well said, Adam. Very well said. So my last question, and then I'll let you go. Really fantastic experience. Is What's the website where my viewers can go and purchase a bottle? Sure. Um, we're, it's just simple. It's www.tobaccobarndistillery.com. Unfortunately, I know you have a wide, wide audience. We're only available in Maryland. And, uh, and we're, there's, a, there's a company called Total Wine. We're at the Total Wine stores here in, in Maryland here too. But it's, uh, we'll be coming, our release, maybe in a couple of years. We, I might get in the Total Wines up near you there, Alex. Wonderful. Well, Admiral, you stay uh, safe. And thank you so much for this fantastic uh, conversation. Great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.